The weekly Industry Angel podcast hears from business leaders and entrepreneurs who share their stories and that all-important light bulb moment. This can inspire us all and maybe scratch that itch and kickstart that idea that keeps you awake at night. Welcome to episode 17 of the Industry Angel. I hope you're well. As I speak to you, we are getting towards June. What's happened there? How scary is that? Super quick this year. I've had another couple of busy weeks with my Canadian cousin, Sam. Sam's over from St. Catharines. That's near Niagara Falls in Ontario. I know we've got some listeners over there in Canada. Uh, It was great to hear what's hot and what's not over there at the moment. What's hot is, of course, Industry Angel. Still sitting there in number one and you were noteworthy. I just sent out a message today, actually. 42% of our listeners are from the US. Uh, So thanks for all your messages from across the pond. We've had a great response for the signed James Ketchel book. His competition had thousands of downloads. We had around 280 retweets uh, in addition to the other avenues to enter. And the winner of the competition is... Paul Hardcastle. Paul dropped me a line and we can sort out how to get that book to you. Can someone tell me never to press that drumroll button as well? We've also got Lisa Spencer Arnell's book up for grabs. Instructions on how to win that one were in episode 16, the last episode. Speaking of Lisa, we had so much feedback uh, for her episode. Regular listeners uh, have emailed in saying how much they enjoyed it. We've got new listeners in Steve Minto and Laura Ward. Laura enjoyed Lisa and is now going to download the back catalogue. And there's quite a few listeners do that, actually. You know, they find the show and they go back with the episodes. If you've recently done that, I'd appreciate your feedback on them shows. Uh, I still keep in touch with some of the guests and, and they love to hear how things are going. Why doesn't, here's, here's one. Why doesn't someone send me their top five so far and, uh, and why, of course? And we might, we might share that out. If you're a new listener or you've never contacted me before, I'd love to hear from you. What I'd like to hear about is guest suggestions, topics, any feedbacks, good feedback. I won't get upset uh, much. <laughs> and it's been great to hear that people are referring the co- podcast as well to their friends and colleagues. I spoke to a lecturer the other day, actually, and uh, it was mentioned in one of the business lectures for for students to listen. So that was great. Okay, let's get this show on the road. Today we have Pete Robinson, Head of Research at the Kids Digital Innovation Agency, Dubit. Hi, Pete. Hi there. Nice to meet you, Pete. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing all about Dubit. Why don't you start off maybe by setting a scene, uh, let us know about some of the clients and projects that Dubit have worked with, maybe. Is that okay? Yeah, sounds perfect. Yeah. So, um, as a, as a one-liner from a, from a W perspective, we are a, a kids entertainment agency. So we specialize in helping clients um, like Mattel and Viacom um, and also startups as well understand who their audience are. Um, so I, I head up the research team and we also have an interactive department who build and develop digital products. So ranging from virtual worlds to applications to um, virtual reality products as well. Um, so a product they've launched recently is PBS Kids Cart Kingdom, which is up for a load of awards in the US at the moment. Um, and we also have a, a website called We Are VR and we're about to launch Bogglebox. They are a kids which is the boggle box and a general audience virtual reality application store um, and they are growing very quickly so we um yeah we specialize in, in kids media and 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 technology essentially so did you always um kind of set out to be in this the kids space pete or was it did something you know did someone contact you to do a project and then it rolled on from there or was that what you guys set out to do so Dubit, definitely. Um, Dubit was set up by 14, 15 year olds. I believe they're in the Guinness Book of Records of being having the youngest board directors in the UK. Um, so they were wow. set up 15 years ago. Ian Douthway, our CEO, um, was a, um, a young enterprise um, moderator helper. So he, he worked with these kids and helped them set up the business. They created the first flash based virtual world, which we had half a million kids on and we, won a BAF, um, we were nominated for a BAFTA. Um, and off the back of that, we then created a digital department and a research department to help us build more products for kids and also understand the audience. Um, so definitely Dubit started in that area. I've never deviated from anything other than kids and family. 
I mean, it's a huge space, but you know what I'm interested in is the amount of stats and market research and infographics available for this space. It, it's huge. Yeah, so so things are changing in the research world. So I, I before I come into kids research, I, I specialised in financial research and high net worth kind of research. Um, and in those days, when I when I was working on that, communities and surveys were how you collected data and focus groups. Now the methods we use for research are moving less away from kind of native research techniques towards, as you say, these these massive data sets and um, really lean and iterative research methods as well. So it's kind of become this this kind of blend of huge data and very, very quick and very focused small pieces of research. So it's it's interesting. It's a challenge at the moment. Where, where does that data come from then, Pete? Is it actually from the core face when, when you know, kids are playing on games and you're do you market to them? Do you ask those questions? Do you email or schools or how do you do it? So, I mean, for for surveys, we we use uh, essentially research panels. So we would go to parents or children and and get them to complete surveys. But I think the the interesting side and, and one thing we specialise in is is collecting digital data. And the, the, there's two considerations for that one: how do you do it ethically? Because you can't collect data on under 13s um, or under 16s in in, in the US. Um, and the other thing is is making sure that they're they're aware they're doing it and that you are asking them the right questions. Um, so one of the things that we we do is we collect tons of data through the apps that we have, um, tons of data through our clients' apps as well, and then we look for patterns amongst that data which give us insights which help us improve the product. So, for example, if there's a a game and there's a certain part of the game where everyone seems to be getting stuck, then it allows us to say, well, why are they getting stuck? Okay, we can see they can't get past that point, and then we can change that point of the game um, and make it more efficient for the user. So, Pete, what sort of platforms are those, are those games played on? Um, so they they really vary. So um, we we still find des- desktop certainly in developed markets. We 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 find there's a lot of kids on those. So uh, PBS Kids, for example, Cart Kingdom is is a platform game. More and more though, that's moving on to mobile and tablet. You know, I mean, the shift from a kid's perspective away from from desktop to to touchscreen is is pretty rapid. Uh, I suppose it will be for the for the younger child as well. I mean, my daughter's seven now. To be honest, she doesn't really go on desktop very much. It's always it's always the tablet. But she loves things like you know kids apps, so like YouTube for kids. You know, she, yeah. she's always on that. And you know what you'll watch um, videos of Minecraft. Yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, my, my Minecraft is is just is a monster. Um, it's it's awesome. Um, but the fact that it became so big is it, the way they launched the product and, and the actual product itself is is very clever. Um, and as you say, I mean, you, YouTube and Minecraft kind of almost grew each other. <laughs> I think that I think the U, YouTube ecosystem would have grown massively anyway, but Minecraft certainly helped it. And Minecraft, from a, a viral perspective, was was hugely assisted by by YouTube and the videos that were shared on YouTube. So, but I think Minecraft aren't the oddest videos that kids watch. So I don't know if you've you've come across the <laughs> the, the unboxing trends. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so that there are there are some very odd videos that that children watch. But funnily enough, when you look at the actual motivations for why kids watch those videos, they're very similar to why an adult would watch something like um phil and kirsty you know kind of going around location location it's all that that kind of idea oh, right, of okay. opening a door and finding things and discovering things you know it's you know it, it, it's a very similar reason why kids watch these videos that us as adults are like well that's very odd whereas kids are looking at us thinking why are my parents watching videos of you know tv shows about about homes <laughs> that's really interesting actually i never thought about that way yeah, jess loves to watch these little um they kind of open the uh, like little toys out of bags. I can't remember what those little toys are now. Shopkins, that's, that's it. right. Yeah, yeah. So they open the Shopkins, and then it's like, what's going to be inside? And then open it up, and it's I don't know, Lucy Lou or something. And it's yeah, lovers and thing like that. Yeah, yeah. They're they're, they're huge, and um, you know, for, for YouTube, it's a um, it's one of their super categories. Unboxing. I mean, the amount of views that that they get is is insane. And I remember going into a home and watching a a young boy who was I think around. Four years old, and he watched a video of a truck, different colored truck, driving across a like a background scene. And it was, you know, an animated truck, and a red truck went past, and then 30 seconds later, a blue truck went past, and 30 seconds later, a yellow truck went past. 
And I watched him watch that video for about four or five minutes and he was besotted with it. And I spoke to his mother and said, you know, how, how long does he watch this for? And she said, oh, anything between 15 and 20 minutes. And it was just the same background and just a truck driving past different colors. And some of these things for, for kids are, are mesmerizing. You know, they, they, they just kind of hook into them and, and really enjoy them. And, and with adults, you know, we, we kind of have that those sorts of tv shows where you're not really watching them but you are <laughs> it's, it's very similar from from that perspective yeah you, you sort of switch off a little bit your mind might be on something else but you're kind of half watching out of the corner of your eye and it's it's not too intense but it's watchable tv yeah and and, and it's daydreaming because i mean before yeah. before i mean when we were growing up before you had all these mobile phones where you could just flick on angry birds or candy crush you know you for for a good part of days when you were stood in queues or in cars you just stared out the window <laughs> and looked at things and you weren't focused on anything you were just daydreaming and I think often these YouTube videos that are that are so mesmerizing are kind of kids equivalent of just switching off and just you know some some light stimulation that just allows them just to, to wander in their head and that, so I think there are benefits to, to some of those sorts of videos. So as a parent, Pete, you know, if I, I'm, I've, I've spoke to lo loads of parents about this and they're always trying to get the tablets out of the kids' hands. Yeah. You know, what, what, what's your feedback on that? You know, when you're, you're saying you're speaking to, to mothers there, are, are they concerned about this and do, do they try and limit the, the amount of time? Um, so I, it's really interesting because the, the answer to that is yes and no. And of course, it, it, it varies by family and it varies by country as well. Um, in America, for example, and Southern Europe, you have much more managed time on, on tablets, um, whereas certainly the UK and the Nordics, for example, we have a, uh, a less strict routine around tablet usage, not because we want our children to have, you know, less educational time, but just because as, as parents, we have we have a different focus. And I think what we tend to see is most parents will have a moment when something bad is watched on YouTube and that acts as a trigger for them to become more involved in how kids access content through tablets and mobile. But generally, they tend to let kids manage it themselves unless there's a problem. Um, and even on YouTube, it's kind of like, you know, two, three-year-olds who are using YouTube, parents will be like, you know, they, they can have the, the tablet for half an hour in the morning whilst my four and five year olds are getting ready for school, you know, because it keeps them quiet, it keeps them focused. Um, so I, I guess the answer is yes. Yes, they do manage it and they should manage it. Um, but most parents are quite happy for the peace and quiet. <laughs> it's a good point you make about, you know, the, the example where the, the, the child might see something on YouTube that, that it's not for them but i guess this youtube kids and, and and i'm sure there's a few other out there who are going towards this app where it's you know heavily locked down is that right uh, yeah i mean so we, we we work with with um you know nickelodeon on their kind of uh, video app we, we've worked a lot with sky kids go on the launch of, of their latest app um but i mean one of the one of the brands we've worked with the most is hopster over the years and and they are you know, specifically focused on creating a content experience, which which they curate as kids media specialists, that academics are involved in, that game designers are involved in. So all the content is focused on giving the child a worthwhile experience, but also giving them access to their favorite brands because kids want their favorite brands. Um, so I, I, I think we will find more and more of specialist curated content for younger audiences. Um, YouTube Kids is, is growing. Um, Massively, it's you know it's, it's really grown in the US, but in reality, kids still use YouTube um, over YouTube Kids, and and well, certainly in my experience, now YouTube might say suggest that data is 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 shifting the other way, but kids love YouTube. I mean, they really love YouTube, and YouTube Kids is is a different product to YouTube. So some kids migrate to it, some kids just happily still watch YouTube. Yeah, my son, I mean, he's twelve and he, he watches YouTube because you've got all these YouTubers on there. You know, he mm. follows all these YouTubers, and you know, people want to grow up now to be a YouTuber. Yeah, I, <laughs> and have have all these subscribers and followers. And I, I personally, I, I, you know, obviously, I'm in the industry, um, and I spend a lot of time thinking about about these sorts of things. And one of the the things I really like about YouTubers, um, some YouTubers, not the weird ones, <laughs> um, <laughs> is that traditionally celebrities were, you know, kids saw them and they were like, wow, you know, David Beckham. Um, and once a kid reaches the age of 11 years old, they realize they're never going to be David Beckham. Um, with YouTubers who have become celebrities, so they're two really important things for kids. They're still aspirational because they've got these huge followings. They, they have a big impact on, on the kids' peers and, and their own communities. 
but they're also attainable. So we kind of say aspiration attainable, like kids can become them if they, if they think, you know, about how they, what, what they want to talk about and what they want to get passionate about, then they can become that, that kind of social commentator. And I think that's a really interesting trend we've seen with, with this next generation of kids. So 12 year olds, for example, is that they're less about trash celebrities. They're less about unrealistic expectations and they're more realistic in what their ambitions are. And YouTubers seem to be that realistic celebrity that, that exists for them. That's a good way of thinking about it. And I guess it does give, um, you know, children a platform to experiment with things like this and, and get out there and, and be creative. Yeah. And, and, and I think, and I think that's where parents have an opportunity to, kind of support kids if, if that's what they you know in 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 minecraft they want to create these amazing these amazing things um they create in minecraft or on youtube if they want to create videos parents can get involved in those things and help nurture that the the, the challenge then also becomes as kids start to become social in those, those environments is that's where the parents need to be you know aware um and protective if required yeah that, that that's my concern as well and especially around the safety of children and you know it's really heavily in schools you, you know yourself you know um he's always coming home with letters about you know to be where, be mindful of what you're putting on the internet and texts and that sort of thing snapchat and yeah lots yeah. going on so in terms of schools as i mentioned my youngest there um she, you know she's in uh, in, a, in a primary school and they're heavily involved in some great pieces of software off the top of my head. Yeah, Spelladrome's one, Purple Mash, Espresso Coding. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that, is this the sort of areas that you guys get involved in in, in helping these um, schools select software? or? Um, we, we, do, we do a lot in education. In all honesty, the coding market is, is really interesting because it's, it's new. Um, so we, we've been into schools and spoken to them a lot about different coding. We, we, we work with Espresso on, on other products, actually. Um, but things like B, BBC's micro bit are, you know, fascinating. So I, I, think, co I think coding is going to become a really interesting part of, um, you know, ch children's learning and development because it, it's so focused on helping them. You know, it's, it's great for physics and maths and, and rationalizing um, choices and decisions. So... We, we know there's a lot of companies who are investing a lot of time into this right now, of which I can't really talk about them because we're, we're under, we're under Hendy Hay on, on, on a few of those. <laughs> but it, I, I think it's going to be a hot area, and I, and I think it's interesting. I, I, I always the, the interesting conversation I had the other day, and I, I do not have an opinion on this because I'm not intelligent enough to have an opinion on this, but is, you know, with, with, with all these developments in digital, um, what's going to happen to writing and reading? And the interesting question that was posed to me is, is, is writing and reading important? <laughs> Does it matter if kids don't write and read anymore and instead move towards this coding and, and, and these different languages? Um, and, and as I say, I don't know the answer. To that. I don't think anyone knows the answer to that right now. Um, it feels like it should be a blend of it. But certainly we see these, these digital tools in schools becoming more widely used. They're very relevant to our adult lives as well from an employment perspective. Um, so I think it's going to be an, I think it's going to be interesting for the education system over the next ten years how it moves as cumbersome as it is kind of how it moves towards towards different learning styles and techniques. Yeah, we we've seen a massive a massive shift. So what about things like VR then? Peter, you you must come across this in, in your world. Um, yeah, so so we, we so we have v, we are VR, um, which is getting more and more investment um, and. It's interesting, and that's primarily based on adults. Well, possibly kids. Well, we've had a few 12, 13 year olds who have actually submitted their own VR games, um, which right. I, think, I think is awesome. Um, but I think for the younger generations, we're about to launch Bogglebox, which is going to be curated by us, and we're doing loads of research with academics as well to understand the impact of VR. I think it's a fascinating area. I think it's a hugely immersive technology. I didn't believe in it for kids when it first came out two or three years ago. Um, of course, it's been around 20 years, but the the, the kind of the um, the resurgence of it through Oculus Rift two two or three years ago. So when we talk to kids, their biggest interest in VR is education, um, is being able to go. We either call it teleportation or time traveling. So either being able to teleport themselves into a different part of the world, for example, learn about the Amazon in the Amazon or time travel back to, you know, Victorian times or World War One or cowboys or or something like that. For them, that's fascinating because it allows them to immerse themselves in different cultures, in different times. And, and that seems to me to be a really sensible growth area. Uh, we just have to do a lot of learning about how kids 
can and should use VR. So did you say We Are VR is particularly at adults, not children, yeah? We Are VR is anyone. Um, Bog- right. Bogglebox is going to be focused, is a, is a kind of a sub-brand of We Are VR, is going to be focused purely on kids. So, you know, as, as kids specialists, we're going to make sure that the content on there is suitable for them from both a you know content perspective but also from an, an interactivity perspective um so for example not having horror experiences or not having um games that are so immersive they flash around and and sure. kids don't enjoy them as much and what about the hardware for that pete what does that look like real variety so when we talk about vr you talk about vr and 360 um video so a lot of consumers experience of vr isn't actually vr it's it's 360 video um and the difference between 360 video and vr is vr essentially is is, is interactive um so you can kind of move around and touch and, and and feel things not actually touch and feel things although haptics will probably make that happen shortly whereas a 360 video is, is more like watching a you know a tv show but it's all around you and most kids right now will be using will be having 360 video experiences on um, uh, Google Cardboard, that would be their first touch point because it's it's cheap, it's accessible, anyone can get hold of it. Whereas Oculus Rift and Samsung and and all these different kind of hardware providers, it's you know a thousand pounds to get your whole setup really really going. Um, so we're not going to see many kids on that yet. And do you see much interest from schools on that one, Pete? Um, not not yet, just because I think from a a health and safety perspective there's still research required to understand the impact from from a, a, a vision perspective so you know children's eyes are fully developed by the age of around seven to eight years old um so any children really under the age of that should they be using it if they are using it is there any impact what is the impact um but there's also impact on children's memory and and so there's a lot of things for us to, to understand before it's kind of placed into mainstream education um and i think that that's going to be the next year two years for us is understanding you know how how kids should be using vr and what the best vr experiences are and i think then from an education perspective it has huge opportunities i just think it's too early still you know pete there's a lot of people sort of leaving university now setting up um games companies you know heavily interested in games are are there many now setting up purely to get into the into the kids space (sighs) Yes, yes, there there are. I mean, the the the, dif- the difference with the kids space is you need to be you need to understand kids. Um, that that's what my my job is to do is, is to help people understand kids. Um, the biggest difficulty is getting to market <laughs> in, in in any entertainment industry, but certainly in the kids industry. Um, talk about a lot of Scandinavian companies have been really successful. So people like Tokaboka and. Um, uh sago sago and mojang as well of course with, with minecraft is sold to microsoft so those sort of companies have been hugely successful you know based on educational values creating really nice entertainment we work with a company called gigglebug who are who are lovely um and i think it's still getting a product to market it's not that easy to get a product to market so that's the the biggest challenge in the kids entertainment space because it's so busy um because everything is on demand and fragmented to get audience is quite hard so is that something you get involved with pete are you are you more so around the research area no i mean a, a big a big part of our our service is, is helping people get to market so we did a lot of work with mattel on the launch of new bob the builder you know it's when, when they when bob the builder was first launched you put it on a slot on tv um now kids watch everything on demand they watch it on youtube you know they they, they play the games they they kind of cross platforms and it's a totally different distribution strategy to what it was 10 years ago um so we do a lot of work helping brands figure out who their early adopter audience is um, and what their early adopter audience wants you know a big message that we have is is don't just present stuff to your early adopter audience, actually involve them in the development of your product, um, involve them in the early feedback, which is what Minecraft did really successfully through a lot of the, the communities they engaged with. You know, They launched the product before it was anywhere near finished and got feedback and built a game based on their audience's feedback, which I think is a, is a super way to create a product. Let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. New York Limited design and manufacture inverter welding power sources and were established over 40 years ago. New York has grown its national and international markets through supplying sectors such as oil and gas, infrastructure, shipbuilding and general fabrication sectors. New York currently exports to the Middle East, the Far East and the Caspian region. 
I've had a tour around the shop floor actually and I've seen firsthand the welding power sources. They're a bright orange case and they proudly carry the Union Jack. They're a great example in Newark of British engineering. Now back to Pete Robinson. I just wrote down Mattel and it, you know, thinking about Mattel, you immediately think of toys and yeah. then suddenly now we're thinking about games. You know, how, how does that happen? Is it just a company trying to pivot and diversify and make sure they're ahead of the game and look commercially? Is, is that what, or they did they fall into it by a, a toy that wanted a game or? I, I, I think there's, um, there's probably a few answers to that. I mean, Mattel are, Mattel are A, innovative and B, their, their kind of mantra is creativity um, so what they want to do is they want to give kids tools to be creative. Now, it comes back to the, the old the old adage of um, the American uh, rail, railroad company who rejected the idea of planes because they said their business was was trains when actually their business was getting people from A to B. Um, and I think, you know, from Mattel's perspective, their business is helping kids be creative. And toys is a huge part of that. But so is TV and story and great characters so is games and tablet experiences and console experiences. So for them, what they need to do is make sure they're on the platforms that kids are on and that they're giving kids tools to help them be creative and express themselves. Um, and toys are part of that and a big part of that because they are a toy company, but other platforms are also hugely important. And didn't you mention Viacom as well? Weren't there a, a TV company? Yes, yeah, so Viacom have Nickelodeon, Comedy Central, um, Nick Jr. Um, and they are, um, you know, one of the biggest kids media networks. And traditionally, if you were wanting to reach the kids audience, Viacom would be, you know, hands down one of your first choices amongst like, Disney and Cartoon Network, you know, and people like that. But now Viacom are competing with Facebook and YouTube, which are huge video distribution platforms. And and, you know, they've gone from being the, the king of video to being, you know, in tight competition with non-traditional partners. And that's before you think about Netflix and <laughs> Amazon Prime and, and all of the other providers as well. Yeah, it's amazing. You, you, you've gave us a great insight there and there's, there's lots of food for thought there. So, Pete, is there anything else you could uh, leave us with before you go or have we covered it all? Um, no, I mean, I'm... My, my what what we focus on at Dubbit is is helping people understand audiences. Um, our kind of mantra is is creating creating products that audiences love. And I know one of the the, the questions you you asked me before the before the call was was um, you know what sort of books books are you reading? And and there was there was a couple. I mean, Malcolm Gladwell and Paco Underhill are great commentators on on how to understand audiences, and and there too we've read, but. The one that's really interesting, and at the start of the, the talk, you mentioned big data. For us, the one that's really interesting is um, Google Ventures' latest book, which is called – oh, crumbs, there you go. I've forgotten the name of it. <laughs> it it's, it's called Sprint, um, and essentially well it's, it's, it's coming up with, with – con- con- <laughs> it's hard work remembering all these names, but, <laughs> but, but Sprint is, is an excellent book. It helps Google Ventures understand if, if products are have an audience and if they have an audience, what the audience looks like. And essentially it's it's kind of a five day rapid prototyping so you come up with an idea and you test that idea within five days and and as well as big data i think that ability to make quick and accurate decisions is is hugely important in in kind of the innovation around kids media and technology so that's that's like um a great book which which speaks to the heart of what we do as a company thanks for giving us a heads up there pete on those books because i know our audience are really interested in, in what books are out there and trying to find new ways of learning I, you know it is you're really different pete and very diverse and i'm sure you're going to be of great interest to our listeners so thanks very much for your time pete it's been brilliant thanks ian great to chat that was pete robinson i hope you find that uh relevant uh, really relevant to me and, and my family with my kids. Uh, really interesting to hear about the you know some countries monitor device usage more than others. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that if if you kind of monitor that. I know we've got a little chart here in the house where you've got to do your homework first or you've got to brush your teeth or whatever before you get the uh, the tablet. I know you guys enjoy hearing uh, about recommended reading as well. Pete mentioned the the design sprint there. I'm a huge fan of this sort of prototyping concept. You know, it can be applied to anything. What we do here is, you know, if it's cheap and it's fast, you can test and learn and test and learn. You know, don't fall in love with your first idea. Don't try and make it work. It won't be a finished article. I'd be really interested to hear if you guys use this sort of sprint philosophy in in your role. Maybe that could be a subject for another episode going forward. Who knows? So until next time, I'm Ian Farrer. This is The Industry Angel, and thanks for listening.